J at the National Institutes of Health. I started there in 1958, and I believe I met him in early 1959. He's a big guy, and um, he can be overbearing at times, but uh, his bark is a lot worse than his bite. I met Dr. Freireich in 1960 when I interviewed for a position at the National Cancer Institute as a clinical associate. And I had a whole day of interviews, and these guys were all talking about things I didn't understand. I could always bounce something off of him. He has is, is, is an encyclopedic knowledge of cancer, and he, he thinks wisely about how to uh, utilize biology and chemistry to uh, try and treat cancer. Freireich was a part of your entire life because you spent your entire uh, waking day uh, in the institution. So uh, Freireich was the, the heart and soul of the, of the department and was constantly involved in everything we did. I think the thing that sets Jay apart is that he, uh, he has no boundaries in his thinking. He has uh, no preconceived ideas. He doesn't lock into a particular point of view. He'll uh, sometimes say the prevailing point of view is X, so I'm going to look at it from the point of view of Y. I was born 1927, and there was a major social event in the United States in 1929 none of which I remember. But I do know from conversations with my mother and my sister that my father died suddenly in 1929 at the height of the crash, presumably related in some way. Uh, my mother and father were first, were immigrants from Hungary. They both spoke English poorly. They ran a little Hungarian restaurant and when my father died, he left my mother with two children, two and five, no money, no job. My mother ended up in a sweatshop, and she did the only thing she could do, which was make hats. And she worked for something like two cents an hour. She worked all hours, we never saw her. Uh, when I was about 10 years old, uh, I got, everybody did, got tonsillitis. And in those days, uh, the treatment for tonsillitis, there were no antibiotics. So we were fortunate to have a family physician who lived in our community, who was a tree grows in Brooklyn type, Dr. Rosenblum. When I had tonsillitis, he said, the treatment is ice cream. Now, how can you beat that? What a prescription. So I loved Dr. Rosenblum, and I spent the next uh, 10 years dreaming of being the most famous doctor in the world. But when I was a senior in high school, there was a, uh, another Tree Grows in Brooklyn guy. He was a PhD in physics. He told me that if I could get $25, I could probably get into, through the medical school. $25, now this is 1944. Yeah. And uh, so my mother said, okay. She'd never seen $25. So she went around amongst the ladies that she circulated with and she found a lady who had inherited some money from her husband's death and was doing good deeds. When I graduated, the, the good, internships were at the private hospitals where you got, you know, good salary and um, nice living quarters and fancy doctors. And I wanted to be a family doctor, so I didn't want to go to a fancy hospital. I decided to go to Cook County Hospital. Well, all the patients are indigent, and there are very few doctors that have any experience. They're all taken care of by the interns and residents. So there's a community of young physicians who are learning to be doctors. And you have enormous responsibility. He called me up for a date first and I wouldn't go out with him. Um, 
he was pretty young and <laughs> I was in my last year of nursing and I, then I was a nurse in the outpatient department at Presbyterian Hospital and he came through as the resident. And Haroldine was the head nurse and I was the resident and that's how we got they I rotated through, actually. They'd come for three First months. First day I walked in, she said, you know, no, do this, no. do that, do the this. The reason I did that, he was always late coming in. And the poor patients were sitting out there, and old party boy was out the night before. So, so after <laughs> but he a while, was a good doctor when he showed up. He was great. Deanie and, and Jay obviously uh, fell in love and, uh, you know, uh, there were elements of the man that were easy to love. There are elements of the man that were really difficult uh, to get along with at different times. He uh, did a lot of the uh, work on uh, the use of platelet transfusions and preventing bleeding in uh, thrombocytopenic patients and the classic paper on the risk of uh, hemorrhage related to the platelet count uh, was a work that uh, that he originated. So the development of um, methodology to collect and store and readminister white cells, platelets, that all came from his work. And, um, and it was his drive that made that happen. And once we controlled bleeding and the mortality went from, well, a big decline in mortality, now we had a chance to investigate combinations of drugs. Jay's personal and direct contribution was uh, uh, the development of uh, one of the first uh, multi-drug combinations to treat childhood leukemia, a VAMP. We formed the first cooperative group. We, we had a very busy 10 years, and as I say, at the end of 10 years, we were certain we'd cured children with leukemia. And in fact, it turned out to be true. But we did a lot of other things. We uh, developed the platelet replacement transfusion program, uh, I hold the patent and invented the continuous flow blood cell separator. Uh, Jerry Bodie was a fellow at the time and he was the first to do empirical antibiotics at the yeah. time. So we had done a lot of things in 10 years and our program was booming and it was, it was clearly the best time of my life. Jay will usually arrive around about uh, uh, 7.30, 8 o'clock, and he will uh, probably leave around about 5 o'clock, so he has a full day. The whole secret of clinical research is get away from the median. Part of this, I think, it's, it's kind of interesting that we have this, you know, this kind of PhD, and it's trying to separate out the basic science component and the clinical Before he took over Grand Rounds, uh, it was really a, a very barren <laughs> area that uh, people were not attending. So he developed a new format that he could take a theme and find uh, three people that were working on different aspects of the theme. And to do that in every area of uh, cancer in a comprehensive cancer center meant that he had to actually study who was here and what they were doing and how to uh, marry all these things in together. In actual fact, once you got used to this style, you knew that the more he challenged you, the, the more the message was, there's something here, there's some gold hidden in this, we just need to find it. But underneath that, there was this um, teddy bear, and he had this incredible connection with patients. Uh, staring you down was no longer there when he related to patients because that was the real fry wreck. Deep breath. Perfect. So did Jay achieve a balance? Probably not. The imbalance where he was uh, giving so much energy to, uh, uh, to figuring out the ways of uh, curing leukemia and other cancers uh, has been the great gift, but it hasn't been a gift that's, uh, that's been given without any cost. I think the family um, lost a lot of his time and attention, um, especially when the kids were teenagers, it was pretty difficult. Yeah. You feel like a single mom, actually, sometimes. Um, this is the one that made my career possible. No, I didn't. Because she kept me sane. <laughs> no. And as she pointed out, in, in order to do this kind of stuff, it takes very long hours. And when you get involved in something, you just, 
its total commitment. So uh, family time was uh, something that you treasure. You know, I could have time with my family, but there was no question about what the priorities were. And my wife knew it, my kids knew it. My work was first priority. <laughs> familiar with the fact that uh, Dr. Uh, Freireich has an addiction uh, to people making speeches about how wonderful he is. Uh, so we've actually uh, we cut all those out this year and we're going to all talk about how wonderful his wife is. His expertise was bringing together people with uh, various qualities that in together uh, made a a very solid team. But he always had the belief that, um, that the human spirit and the human intellect and, uh, was able to, uh, to conquer uh, whatever was presented to it. I do feel that uh, his, uh, while he has received a lot of uh, recognition for what he has done, that uh, his work has in some respects been underappreciated. But the other contribution that he's made is is to make clinical research, clinical investigation important. But I hope that uh, the history of medicine in general and oncology in particular will remember Freireich as one of the giants of the field, one of the true pioneers in the field, and one of the positive leaders in the field. He's a very good leader of a group so that I think he recognizes excellence in people. So that I think he was an excellent recruiter. I remember very well him telling us at one point that uh, your the progress will be made if you don't spend your time thinking about getting credit for it. Because the old academic style was that you taught your medical students, you taught your residents. You took care of your patients, you served on a committee, and you had a little lab project that you did so you could call yourself a scientist. Freireich did work in the lab, but more importantly, the lab was the clinic. And he, I think, is convinced that you can't have good clinical research without having trained, informed, knowledgeable physicians. He has trained, again, uh, at least two generations of oncologists. So that should be a, an important legacy. He is certainly the most important intellectual presence uh, in my life before. I now have a certain amount of uh, fame or notoriety in a particular area, and he's the only one that really consistently challenges me to do better. The rest just say, no, oh, Keating's better at that than I am, so he can do that. But he never lets you rest, which is good. I go to work every day, and I do things no one else can do, and what I do saves human beings' lives. I've saved lots of lives in my career, and I've got more to do. Mm -hmm.